everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We still have a few people in the process of dialing in, but we are a few minutes uh, past the top of the hour. So let's get started. Uh, we are here today to canvas key differences in international arbitration between Canada and the United States. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce the discussion with my colleagues from the United States to help assist Canadian businesses understand how to navigate international arbitration in the United States. Next month, we will be running the second webinar in the series and looking at international arbitration in Canada for American businesses. A few housekeeping remarks at the outset. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A feature. We will be monitoring that and we'll do our best to answer questions as they arise. This session is also being recorded and it will be distributed after the event in case you need to deck out and do miss some of what I am sure will be a very lively and engaging discussion with this panel. Lastly, for those getting a start on their CPD for the year, our session is registered for 60 substantive minutes with the Law Societies of British Columbia and Ontario. It also meets CLE requirements for the Barreau du Quebec. And now on to introductions. I'm Rachel Howie. I'm the Deputy National Lead for the Litigation and Dispute Resolution Group in Canada. My practice focuses primarily on arbitration, international commercial, investor state, and domestic. So I will do my best to moderate the discussion today. Our speakers are John Hay, Diora Ziaeva, and Kristen Weil. John Hay is a partner in Denton's New York office and the head of the US International Dispute Resolution Group. He has more than 35 years experience representing domestic and international clients in complex commercial and investment treaty disputes. His practice involves matters in federal and state courts throughout the US and before arbitration tribunals throughout the world. John has arbitrated disputes in a wide variety of areas, including construction, energy, joint ventures, financial services, real estate, and investments in foreign countries. He has also served as a party appointed arbitrator. In addition, John has extensive experience representing clients in mediation. For more than 10 years, he served as a member of the panel of mediators of the US District Court for the Southern District of New York. John serves as an adjunct professor of law at Cornell Law School, where he teaches the practice of international arbitration. Kristen Weil, a partner in Denton's New York office, also represents domestic and international clients in complex commercial litigation and international arbitration. Kristen has won favorable verdicts and resolved well before trial commercial cases, including class actions and multi-district litigation in US federal and state courtrooms throughout the country. Kristen also represents domestic and international clients before international arbitration tribunals, including the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, the London Court of International Arbitration, and the International Chamber of Commerce. Kristen has arbitrated disputes in a wide variety of areas, including construction, software, licensing, and investments in foreign countries. And last but not least, we have Diora, counsel in Denton's New York office. She focuses on international investment arbitration, international commercial arbitration, complex commercial litigation, and public international law. Licensed in New York and Uzbekistan and fluent in seven languages, Diora serves as counsel in a broad range of complex disputes under numerous bilateral, multilateral investment treaties and contracts, successfully handling cases ranging in value from 10 million to 20 billion, with experience in energy, oil and gas, mining, telecommunications, construction, and aerospace disputes in Latin America, Central Asia, Middle East, Eastern Europe, Oceania, and Africa. Diora has over a decade of experience representing corporate clients, states, and state-owned entities in investor state and commercial arbitration proceedings, both institutional and ad hoc. Diora also advises parties in international litigations involving proceedings in foreign and domestic courts and has represented parties before the federal and state courts in the United States, including the United States Supreme Court. She also serves as an adjunct professor of law at Cornell Law School, where she teaches the practice of international arbitration, and at Fordham University School of Law, where she teaches investment treaty arbitration. And without further ado, moving on to the substance of our discussion today, I will turn it over to our panel to introduce the topic of what is the legal or statutory scheme for international arbitration in the United States. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, and I, I'll get started with that. Uh, just this is by way of background. And before I do that, I just want to welcome everyone who has joined us today and hope we will find this interesting and uh, 
hope that you'll be able to ask some questions that uh, you may have specifically about the topic, which will uh, certainly make it more interesting. Uh, from, from a US perspective, you, you first have to define what international arbitration is. Uh, and that is under, under kind of US law, uh, a situation where any arbitration that doesn't involve uh, parties that are from the US. That means any uh, foreign party against the US party, a, any uh, foreign party against a foreign party, those are all international arbitration. You can also have international arbitration from a US perspective if it's between two US citizens, so long as the subject matter relates to a project outside the US or may involve enforcement or some other performance outside the US. So the question is, why is that important as to how you define what international arbitration is? And the reason is because if it's an international arbitration, it's governed by US federal law, and in particular, the Federal Arbitration Act. If it's not international arbitration, it's governed, it could be governed by state law. And uh, the state in the United States have their own uh, procedural acts that deal with uh, procedures for arbitration, but those only involve domestic arbitrations, not international arbitrations. Now, having said that, uh, state law is not totally uh, unimportant in terms of international arbitration to the extent that the federal arbitration law does not cover something and is not contradicted by state law. State law often uh, is relevant to disputes in international arbitration. And uh, in a sense, a recent example of that was a case before the United States Supreme Court where uh, the Supreme Court decided that state law as it relates to whether or not a uh, non-signatory of a arbitration agreement can actually enforce the arbitration agreement is governed by state law. And because the, neither the federal law nor the New York Convention it was contrary to that state law, it allowed in that particular case a non-signatory to uh, be able to enforce an arbitration clause and uh, proceed with arbitration under the federal statute. So that's why it's important to determine uh, whether it's international arbitration or not. And as I said, it, it is important because it's the federal law that totally governs. We don't, we don't have a situation like in Canada where there may be provinces that have individual laws or anything like that. It's all governed by federal statute. Yeah, go Sorry. ahead. I, I don't know if my colleagues have any want to make any other comment or, you know, we can move on. It, that's really more just of a background of, of, of the, the landscape for uh, arbitration practice in the U.S. On, when it's an international dispute. And, and very helpful because it is a, a distinction between the two countries in terms of the legislative background. Uh, Diora, Kristen, any comments on that topic, or, or should we move on to what the key issues are for business with respect to international arbitration in the U.S.? Um, I think that we're ready to move on. The only um, additional comment I would make, as with any dispute, it's always important to engage a local practitioner to help navigate those distinctions, uh, because they can trip up someone who is unfamiliar with a, a local jurisdiction system. And that applies equally to disputes outside of the US where you'd want um, a practitioner familiar with the practices there, as well as uh, disputes that are inside the US where you would want a US practitioner to weigh in on some of those um, distinctions. Indeed, uh, indeed. And have there been any developments uh, lately for our clients on the line who are, are transacting or have operations in, in both countries that? key issues that they might want to consider with respect to international arbitration um, clauses or procedures or legal developments in the U.S.? Uh, absolutely. Uh, this is a great topic. Um, you know, careful drafting of your dispute resolution clause uh, can avoid very costly problems in the future. And there are a number of issues that we generally recommend that contract drafters consider when they're building this into their contract. Uh, and many are similar 
between the US and Canada. So I think some of the core considerations um, are probably uh, equally well known to Canadian practitioners as to the US. So things like making sure that you uh, expressly um, identify the party's desire to arbitrate, uh, providing a choice of law for substantive and procedural issues, uh, specifying a language for the proceeding. So providing those kinds of general drafting tips, do's and don'ts, that can um, be an entire seminar on its own. But uh, what I wanted to do was focus on just a couple of key aspects that might be approached a little bit differently from a US practitioner's eye. Um, so one, uh, specifying who is going to be covered by the arbitration clause. And um, John alluded to that um, a moment ago. It's very important to um, identify whether you want your clause to be limited only to the parties uh, and have them only be subjected to arbitration, or whether you want to allow non-party participation to enforce that arbitration clause. And in the US, that needs to be um, expressly stated uh, whether um, you want to have it be limited or if you want it to be focused only on the parties. So if you want to avoid third party participation, you should say so in your clause by limiting it to the parties. That's a key distinction that a practitioner should be aware of. Secondly, attorney's fees. Um, the US differs from many other jurisdictions with respect to attorney's fees. Here in the US, we have something that's known as the American rule. Um, where each party bears its own costs, uh, regardless of who wins or loses. And so there are some limited exceptions that are provided under US law, specifically if a contract expressly provides for um, fees to be shifted, uh, or in, for a few limited statutes where recovery of attorney's fees and cost shifting is permitted. And that um, often catches um, international um, companies by surprise that this is the practice here in the US. Uh, so, because this um, American rule where everyone is bearing their own costs and there's not a loser pays approach can be a significant factor in deciding how to handle your dispute, we recommend that when you're drafting your arbitration clause that you really give thought to this issue when you're dealing with um, an international party here, or excuse me, an American party, um, because the views on this issue may differ. So, spell out. How should fees be handled? What does it mean to be a prevailing party? Um, you should not just rely on your international arbitration forums rules because some of them allow discretion for the arbitrator to award fees, but don't mandate a certain approach. So um, think through this issue and build it into your clause so that it doesn't catch you by surprise um, at the end of your proceeding. Um, another key difference um, that contract drafters should be aware of when they're dealing with um, U.S. counterparties is discovery differences. Uh, the U.S.'s reputation for expansive discovery is well-deserved, and in domestic U.S. litigation here, the discovery process is one of the um, longest, most expensive, um, and hard-fought phases in the litigation. And many parties choose to move their disputes from domestic litigation to international arbitration in large part to avoid US style discovery. But one issue that we have seen is that in drafting a arbitration clause, sometimes parties will um, build back in that expansive US style discovery by incorporating US uh, procedural rules, either from a state procedural rule or a federal procedural rule. And um, you shouldn't do that if you want to be um, taking advantage of the efficiencies that international arbitration provides and avoiding the US style. Um, again, it's very broad here. You have depositions, extremely expansive document discovery, including um, ESI or electronically stored information that can extend to um, management and executives' um, personal devices, their cell phones, their laptops. This can really catch certain international parties by surprise. So um, we do not recommend for all of those reasons that when you are drafting and negotiating your arbitration clause that you include a reference to uh, the procedural laws of the US, either at a state or a federal level. There's gonna be some slight variations between the two, but generally speaking, 
it's always going to be much more expansive than you would otherwise get in a typical international arbitration proceeding. And then finally, one other discovery related note that I wanted to uh, raise here, which could be different, um, is that there is a, a US statute, uh, 28 USC 1782, which is commonly referred to as section 1782. And that might not be something that everyone um, is aware of, but um, this is a statute that relates to discovery assistance from US courts in aid of foreign proceedings. Um, briefly, you can apply to a US federal court and obtain an order to get testimony or documents for use in a proceeding um, in, a, in a quote, foreign or international tribunal. And uh, this isn't something so much that people can be aware of as they're drafting and negotiate around, but it is something that um, practitioners should be aware of right now because it's a very hotly disputed issue about whether private commercial uh, arbitral tribunals constitute a quote, foreign or international tribunal within the meaning of this um, statute. So um, this issue is actually going to be before the Supreme Court of the United States next month. Um, and so they will be trying to decide this issue about whether section 1782 applies to co uh, private commercial arbitration or not. Um, the ICC has submitted an amicus brief on this issue. Um, they urge uh, the Supreme Court to take the position that uh, a 1782 petition should really afford a great deal of deference to the arbitral tribunal about whether this discovery is necessary um, and relevant. Uh, so it remains to be seen uh, what will happen, but the outcome of the Supreme Court's review next month could have some significant impacts on um, private international commercial arbitration. So not much that parties can do right now, uh, but it's something to be aware of. So those are a couple of key distinctions. Depending on the, on the outcome, is it something that possibly people could draft around or is it unknown at this point whether the court would be able to rule in a way that it, you, you couldn't impact that, that scope and that 1782 possibility through drafting? Well, it will depend in part on how the court's ruling is shaped, but um, it could result in a binary situation where if parties want to proceed in a private commercial international arbitration, they'll have to be aware um, that that kind of assistance either may or may not be available to them. So they may select a different kind of dispute resolution mechanism. Um, so it's a little hard to predict how that will impact things, but it's certainly something to, um, or at least practitioners to keep an eye on to see the developments in the law. Those are those are excellent points, and even going back to the scope of discovery, I, I know when uh, when some rules were first promulgated up here in Canada, one of the editorial comments was U.S. style discovery is not necessarily. Um, not necessarily sufficient. So that's that's also something that it's probably a best practice to look at drafting into your arbitration clause and not just relying on, on rules. Absolutely. Um, I think it would be, I don't wanna speak for John and Diora, but I think it would be all of our um, advice to think through these issues and spell them out clearly in your clause so that you don't inadvertently um, walk into uh, a situation that you do not want. So people should be clear-eyed about what their clause uh, requires or permits. Yeah, and just, to, just to comment on that point, uh, what, is, what is important is uh, when you're drafting, you, you, especially with respect to discovery, you, you really have to focus on the, the particular rules you're, you're including uh, because as you all probably know, there, there are a number of institutions in the United States, whether it's the American Arbitration Association, the ICC, uh, JAMS, uh, et cetera, that have not only have uh, a set of rules for arbitration, but they also international arbitration, but they have other rules for other types of disputes. You know, for example, the American Arbitration Association has uh, rules for construction disputes or for com for commercial disputes. And with respect to discovery, those rules are slightly different. And with, with respect to, as, as Kristen alluded to before, awarding costs and attorney's fees, those rules are slightly different. Uh, for example, in uh, for the American Arbitration Association, under their international rules, their ICDR rules, you know, costs are, uh, attorney's fees are recoverable, but 
under their other rules, the, the construction rules and the commercial rules, uh, it's recoverable if the parties agree that they're recoverable or the law provides. And as Kristen said, the law doesn't generally provide for, for cost. And, and the same is true for discovery in, you know, jams and uh, in their comprehensive rules, they provide for great flexibility. And there's almost an expectation of, if not US style discovery, a lot of discovery because, you know, they provide that you, you know, you can take at least one deposition, that kind of thing. So it's, but if you look at their international rules, they, they don't have those kind of requirements. So, you know, the, the takeaway from our perspective is, you know, look, you're, you're an international company doing business in the United States. You should be follow, you should be under the international rules and you should specify that because it, it does matter in terms of issues like discovery, like recovery of cost attorney's fees. So, uh, so in each instance, you, you need to, you know, when you're signing up for a rule, for a particular set of rules, you need to understand that even if you have a construction dispute, you may want to have the international rules because it, it provides, it, it does have certain different provisions. So you need to look at that. Uh, and that's, you know, somewhat, I assume somewhat different than Canada in which, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure the international rules are similar, but I'm not sure how much they, the Canadian rules get into, uh, the weeds in terms of uh, issues like cost recovery and uh, discovery. Yeah, indeed, it is very different. Um, I, I, on that topic of drafting, one item that we do tend to see a lot up here in Canada is the the two step or the multi tier dispute resolution clause with negotiation and or mediation in advance of arbitration. Uh, it, how, how does that work in the United States under, uh, under international arbitration laws that, that would apply to a dispute? Well, it's a situation where, well, there's been a lot of litigation, we'll start with that, in the U.S. on those clauses, because if they're not drafted properly, uh, they really just spawn litigation. And what typically uh, is involved in the litigation is in like two or three different areas. One is that in the typical two-step, you know, you have what mediation and then arbitration. You need to, in drafting it, be be very explicit as to what you have to do to commence the mediation and what you have to do to end the mediation uh, and start the arbitration. So rather than using terms like uh, you're going to mediate in good faith or or things of that nature or being open-ended or subjective in in some of the descriptions of what you're going to do you really need to be very objective and say, if you, if you want to start the dispute resolution process, you start it by, uh, you know, filing a document requiring or asking for mediation, and then you mediate for 30 days. And in thir after 30 days, you can move on and arbitrate the with the understanding that the parties can always extend that if they want, but you don't want to be in a situation where, you know, a mediation or a negotiation goes on for months and you're prevented from arbitrating. So that, that's the first issue that usually comes up in those cases. The second issue is that uh, there are often situations where uh, th th these are you basically interpreted as condition precedents to arbitration. And, and that is fine. The issue comes up when what happens when you need some kind of emergency relief to, uh, before you arbitrate? Uh, or before, you know, what, during the course of the mediation, or all of a sudden you need, you know, the other side is doing something that requires you to get an injunction. You know, technically under the clause, until you finish the mediation, you can't arbitrate. So you can't go to the arbitrators or for that matter, a court and get an injunction. So in drafting the clause, you need to take into account that just says that, you know, this, this obligation for this two-step process you know, does, is, does not affect the, either party's ability to get an injunction. Um, and the second and the third thing that usually comes up is, uh, and it's rarer, but it happens, which is, you know, you have to mediate for a certain period of time. And, and during that time period, you have a statute of limitations issue. What do you, what do, you do with what do you do in those circumstances? Uh, what what we have often seen is uh, 
a clause that says once you start the mediation, you're tolling the statute of limitations for that period of time. Uh, the question, but frankly, we've never seen whether or not that has been particularly effective because generally it, it, you would think it would be, but there actually is some law in some uh, states that say you can't toll a statute of limitations or uh, have a provision for tolling a statute of limitations until uh, there's actually a dispute. So uh, it's a question about whether those are enforceable, but I think the better, the better view is that they are and that in any event, you need to protect yourself by, by taking that action to include that kind of tolling during the mediation period. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, any clause that, that has this two-step process should make clear that it's the arbitrator, not a court, that is gonna decide compliance with the two-step procedure. This way, you, know, you commence the arbitration, the other side can say that you didn't uh, follow the correct procedures, but at least that's an issue for the arbitrator to decide as opposed to the court, uh, which actually leads to a bigger issue uh, in the US, which is somewhat different than, uh, than uh, in Canada. And that, that is, uh, you know, who decides arbitrability? Indeed, indeed. And I know in Canada, uh, competence, competence filters throughout the legislation and the law on arbitrability. Uh, how is that determined in, in the United States? Actually, I can speak on that, Rachel. Thank you so much. Um, good day, everyone. It is good to be here today. Um, and I think the question is quite important in light of um, latest development in the US. Uh, so let's start with what is arbitrability or competence competence principle. So it provides, as we as most of you know, an international arbitral tribunal sort of a power to consider and decide um, dispute concerning its own jurisdiction. What's, what's I think important to note in the United States is that the process is a little bit different because in the United States, there is no default rule giving arbitrators the authority to decide their own jurisdiction. So for, as a background, um, there is a Federal Arbitration Act in the United States. It was enacted in 1925, so uh, it's been a while. And um, the, following that enactment, in assessing whether a given dispute falls within the scope of an arbitration clause, courts have generally applied a presumption of arbitrability. What that means is that the, is that the court will presume that a matter is arbitrable unless proved otherwise. However, what's interesting is that in addressing who gets to decide whether the matter is within the scope of the arbitration clause, the, whether it's a court or the arbitrators, this is where the rule is different in the US. So here, the presumption of arbitrability that I just talked about does not apply. So on the contrary, the rule is that the question of whether the parties had agreed to arbitrate a given dispute is to be decided by the court, not the arbitrator, unless this is a very, and this is a very important unless, there is a clear and unmistakable evidence that the parties agreed to have that issue, the issue decided by the arbitrator, in which case the court will leave this issue to arbitral resolution. So what it means in practical terms um, is that the recent trend has been for courts to find that the issue of arbitrability has been delegated to the arbitrator. So in, in the first instance, it must be decided by the arbitrator. In some cases, this was, we've seen in case law because the language of the arbitration clause itself was broad enough to encompass arbitrability. And in other, it was because the parties had, as it, as it was quite commonly done, agreed to have uh, their arbitration governed by the rules of an administering organization that John mentioned that expressly provided for the arbitrator to decide his or her own jurisdiction um, of which the rules were deemed to be incorporated into or you know, otherwise part of the party's agreement. So while this is sort of an abstract proposition, this rule seems easy to administer, but there are complications that may arise. So for example, Let's just from impractical terms, look at the situation. What would happen if a party claimed a right to arbitration 
in a case where the arbitration agreement incorporated the rules of the ICC, International Chamber of Commerce, which provides that the arbitrator shall decide his or her own jurisdiction, but the disputed issue is clearly and unmistakably outside the scope of the arbitration clause. Sometimes situations like this happen. Could a court rule that the dispute is not subject to arbitration and resolve the merits of the dispute? Or would the party resisting arbitration be forced to go through the process of arbitration only to obtain the ruling, which, is, which may seem inevitable, that the dispute is not arbitrable before proceedings in the court? So in a recent uh, history, there was a recent decision, Henry uh, Schein, where the US Supreme Court considered this issue and held that assuming an arbitration agreement contains a clear and unmistakable, unmistakable delegation of authority to decide issues of arbitrability to an arbitrator, the issue of arbitrability must be decided by arbitrator rather than the court even if argument for arbitrability is wholly groundless. So in reaching its decision, the, the court stated that when the party's contract delegates, uh, delegates the question of arbitrability, arbitrability to an arbitrator, the, cost, uh, the courts must respect the party's decision as embodied in the contract. So this, uh, some um, commentators criticize this approach, calling it an absolutist approach. Um, we also see that uh, some lower courts have found ways to effectively work around it to avoid what they perceive um, and sometimes call unreasonable results. For example, um, in Metropolitan Life Insurance case and 2020 communication with Crawford, the courts focused on whether the question of arbitrability at issue had been clearly and unmistakably delegated to the arbitrator, right? The point that had been assumed but not really decided by the Supreme Court in Shine. And the slower courts concluded that it had not, so sort of leaving arbitrability issue open for decision by the court. So strictly speaking, the question of who decides arbitrability is different from the su substantive question of whether the dispute is arbitrable. And that's what the lower court um, decided. Um, nonetheless, the approach embodied in those cases, uh, basically, the, the, that comports with common sense and is, is, is likely to be followed. Um, I think the issue when it comes to injunctive relief, um, it, it also poses similar complex issues. So as an initial step, one should consider, you know, whether the what exactly arbitration agreement says about the type um, of relief that is sought under injunctive relief. This day's arbitration clauses, as Kristen pointed out about general right arbitration clause, they will sometimes contain an explicit carve out allowing some types of relief to be sought in court or explicit, explicitly, for example, permit arbitrator to issue broad interim relief when necessary. So if before in past years, we haven't seen this nowadays, we see more advanced arbitration clauses. So when parties agreement does not address this issue in the, UNA, in the United States, it is generally accepted that parties can seek injunctive relief before either the court or the tribune, arbitral tribunal. So most likely the parties will turn to courts, that's what practice shows, particularly when they face with issue at early stages of dispute, right? Where, the, where an arbitrator might not even be, have been selected, the tribunal is not constituted. Um, so although courts are wary of infringing of the party's intent to submit their dispute to arbitration, they will also assist the parties where not doing so would, would cause harm. Um, so it is important to note that most major arbitration rules in the United States provide that the choice to seek interim relief in court does not constitute a waiver of the right to arbitrate. There's been a number of cases uh, in recent history I think in practice, I see that there is an increased number of arbitral institutions that provide for injunctive relief and emergency procedures, which we'll talk a little bit. Um, and that allows the parties to submit all disputes sort of to arbitration, right? Um, and that we see this in ICC, we see this um, in other um, uh, rules of other, uh, revised rules of other institutions. So in terms of seeking injunctive relief, depending on the applicable arbitration rules, parties may have a choice between going to court and asking the tribunal to grant such relief. 
Um, so essentially the, the choice is yours, unless of course the party's agreement or the arbitral rules specify otherwise. It either would in theory have competence to issue such relief. That is a, a fascinating distinction. And building on that, are there are there practical tips that you can offer to help make an international arbitration process more efficient, uh, or to uh, to help? Uh, you know, we always want to uh, the, the speedy, cost efficient solution is one of the draws to international arbitration. Are there any distinctions or nuances to procedures in the U.S. that could assist with that? Well, well I'm not sure. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Jen. I was gonna. I was gonna say. Let, let me start by, you know, the most efficient thing in, in, uh, would be to make sure that your arbitration clause is particularly tight and good because uh, that's where a lot of delay and cost can arise because you end up running to court to figure out what the arbitration clause means. And and as a specific example. Uh, on the topic that Diora was talk, just talking about in terms of uh, who decides arbitrability, uh, one, of the, one of the things that we recommend our clients do, which is actually different than what, you know, uh, if you look at the institutions and their form arbitration clauses provide, we actually suggest uh, that the uh, arbitration clause starts out by saying that you know it's going to cover all disputes you know arising or related to the agreement, including you know and sometimes there's you know formation, et cetera, uh, enforceability. But we would we would include arbitrability to make it clear that you don't have to rely on any you know incorporation by reference to the the institution's rules. Instead, what you're saying right up front is that we want the arbitrator to decide arbitrability as part of uh, uh, the scope of what the arbitration clause is gonna cover. So that, that's, that's a start to help. And as I said, generally, uh, if, you, if you have a, uh, and, if, and if you deal with the other issues that we've been talking about today in terms of discovery, et cetera, in your arbitration clause, that, that's the first step in, in making it more efficient. And I defer to Kristen to, to pick up on that if you'd like. Yeah, I would echo the, the general thrust of John's comment, which is just to think through what you are or are not including in your arbitration clause. Um, and a lot of this is not so much difference, differences regionally, but rather thinking about how you want your proceeding to be structured wherever you, you and your client are located. So in terms of efficiencies, um, some of the things that we would recommend clients to consider are how many arbitrators you want. You know, a three-person um, tribunal is going to be, generally speaking, more expensive and maybe, uh, you know, it's going to take a longer amount of time because you're juggling multiple people's schedules to try to get a hearing date on the calendar, for example. On the other hand, if this is a bet the company dispute for your client, that additional time and perhaps inefficiency may be well worth it to get a theoretically better reasoned decision. Um, we've already talked about making sure that your clause doesn't include US style discovery, which is one of the biggest ways to make a proceeding more efficient. And um, so we certainly wanna underscore that, that you should not incorporate procedural rules um, that are going to inadvertently drag in these very robust discovery practices. Um, one thing that the last couple of years have taught everyone uh, is that remote proceedings may be a little bit more doable than we all thought. Um, I think as international practitioners, everyone was flying around all the time for preparation meetings, um, interviews with witnesses and experts, and then the hearings themselves, uh, drawing upon clients and practitioners and arbitrators from all over the world. Um, I think we've all learned that we can effectively service client needs and, and really present a robust um, advocacy remotely. So it's something to consider. Now, there are certainly downsides to doing that. Um, there can be real concerns uh, about cross-examination. For example, making sure uh, that there's a live person in front of your tribunal, either because you wanna put a human face on your client's claim, uh, you don't wanna be far removed. To have someone own your client's story in person can be very powerful. 
um, or because you want the tribunal to really test and view that person's credibility in person in a way that um, doing it remotely cannot uh, be accomplished as effectively. There's also concerns about um, translation, which can be a little tricky, interpretation services remotely. Uh, the three of us actually had a hearing um, last year that was remote that involved interpretation and it worked, but it has some challenges to it as well to try to handle that process remotely. So the bottom line, there, there are pros and cons to remote proceedings, but it can certainly be something that can ease some efficiencies um, or some challenges. Um, there's also, you know, one thing that uh, would be uh, something that I think the whole um, practice is moving towards is more environmentally friendly proceedings. So moving towards an electronic green proceeding, um, getting away from all the kinds of hard copies that um, international arbitration can so often have. Um, so those are some, some general comments about efficiencies that really, I think, apply to um, anyone who's in the field, um, but I feel that they're important to consider. Indeed. Uh, in terms of seats and jurisdictions across the United States, are there, are there specific uh, seats that might be, uh, quote, better or, quote, more friendly to international arbitration than others? Uh, and, and are there institutional rules that tend to be used more often than others, uh, you know, keeping in mind that goal of efficiency and, and, and cost effectiveness and streamline proceedings? Maybe to, um, to build up on what John already said about the arbitral institutions, um, I, uh, it, it is worth noting that in the US there are several institutions that one can work with. And, um, just, just to list them so that there's a full list. One is the American Arbitration Association, as well as its international division, which is the International Center for Dispute Resolution. There is the ICC, which is the International Chamber of Commerce. Um, uh, in, it's in, under the International Commercial Court. Uh, there are GEMS, which are formerly known to some of you as Judicial Arbitration and Mediation Services. Um, there is a CPR Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution. Uh, there is a Singapore International Arbitration Center, which has been increasingly used, for example, by Californian entities engaging in businesses in, um, with Asia-based entities. Uh, SIAC actually op opened its first office outside of the U.S., uh, outside of um, Singapore in the U.S. in 2021. And uh, interesting statistic is that US parties consistently have ranked among the top foreign users of the Singapore International Arbitration Center. So opening the center branch in the US is kind of long overdue. Um, there's been some recent trends among those institutions. The trends includes revising its rules to address the, uh, the increasing desire to use the expedited arbitration. So expedited procedure has been integrated into the AAA ICDR revised rules. They, they can be found now virtually in all of the rules. Uh, the emergency arbitration, it's, uh, it's also increasingly used um, in, uh, among users. Um, of course, um, you, you see this in the ICC that actually was one of the pioneers in introducing emergency arbitration in its rules. and. Um, we see, we have seen uh, it also interesting statistic in the course of the last two years. There's been an uptick in the use of emergency arbitration proceeding in ICC, and the um, U.S. Uh, the the U.S. users were half of the users who initiated the emergency arbitration proceeding at the ICC worldwide. So that's that's actually quite an interesting um, demonstration. Um, so another thing that, that uh, you see in the United States that there's been increased uh, uh, focus uh, among international arbitral institutions on diversity in arbitral appointments. Um, for example, the ICDR AAA reported that 33% of its arbitrator appointments were, di were diverse. And here in New York, New York International Arbitration Center has adopted the diversity and inclusion policy. Um, and has taken steps to increase diversity in boards of executive committee. Um, the rules, institutional rules in the US are just like in um, everywhere else in the world, 
uh, have responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. And there's been an introduction of virtual hearing and digital tools that's now been incorporated into the revised rules. And of course, another big issue that predates pandemic, but still remains to be quite important nowadays is of course, data protection and cybersecurity. So that's another thing that the all of the United States arbitral institution across the board address. Um, in terms of interesting things uh, for, for, for you guys to keep in mind, I think is um, one thing that in 2021 ICC rules came to effect and they address interesting new development in the field. So for example, they make it mandatory to disclose the identity of any third party funders. So that's, uh, that's one of the interesting developments to keep in mind. Um, when you choose certain arbitral institution, you should look at the way the arbitral selection process works because it differs between some institution, you know, one institution to another. Some provide you the complete names of, uh, of all the arbitrators for you to choose from. Some actually pre-select for you. So this is something to also consider. In terms of seats, uh, the question that Rachel, you, you raised, there are at least three, if not four, globally recognized seats in the US. New York, it's considered an arbitration-friendly jurisdiction with, with long-established uh, institution. There's also Washington DC, which is the center uh, of investment, international investment disputes uh, worldwide. Um, Miami is also growing in reputation as the seat for international arbitration, particularly involving those the, the Latin American parties. Um, and I think uh, this, this has been happening for the, at least the last nine years, so it's not a new development. The attractiveness of Miami as, a, uh, as an arbitral tree, uh, the seat has increased because it, not only because of its proximity to Latin America, but because um, in Latin American qualified attorneys can participate in international arbitration um, arbitration uh, in, in, in Miami. So uh, this, is, this is quite important for, for those users from these jurisdictions. Houston is developing as a popular choice for arbitration, especially in the energy and construction field. So um, it it's, uh, really depends on what uh, your client needs and what, what would be most appropriate, but there are a bunch of recommendations and uh, institutions and seeds that could be considered and helpful. Yeah, just to add to that, uh, you know, as as a as I said earlier, it the arbitration is going to be generally governed by federal law, so it really doesn't matter where the location is, except to this extent, as, as Dior said, some some venues like Miami and New York, as examples, uh, have a lot of experience dealing with arbitration issues when when they do go to court. So, a, as a matter of fact, both. Florida and New York have established or identified specific judges who are uh, who are to handle arbitration cases because they you know this way they develop some expertise there. So in, in that sense, uh, you know those those are the jurisdictions that we would we would be recommending. Uh, but it, you know overall they're going to apply federal law generally speaking, but. Uh, at least they, the judges in those particular jurisdictions have more familiarity than 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 you know picking a you know a different state or a different city uh, for the arbitration. The other comment, uh, just adding to what Kristen said about efficiency in general, is you know one of the most important decisions on efficiency is who the chairperson is. I mean, th we all we you know when we vet potential arbitrators uh, who, are, who is going to be the, the, the president of the tribunal, if you would, we would, uh, we often look at, you know, what do we know about them in terms of how they ruled in the past or what, what we can say. Uh, but we also, as, as a firm, very much spend a lot of time trying to get information about uh, that particular person and whether he or she has acted as a chairperson before, because you really want someone with experience who and, and how they did, because you want someone with experience as a chairperson, you want someone who has, uh, has a very good reputation of controlling a case because they move the case along. If you don't have, if, if this is the, a chairperson more than the other arbitrators deals with procedural questions and, and uh, you know, schedule and things like that, uh, can, is kind of controlled by that chairperson. So 
it, it's very important if you want to have an efficient uh, arbitration that you have someone who is, who is experienced and with a reputation of uh, being very good at controlling and moving the case along. Uh, in addition to you know someone who is is unbiased and fair, you and and obviously smart because you want you want a good reasoned decision. Uh, you also want them to uh, you want them to be able to move the case along as well. We've talked a bit about the federal nature of international arbitration legislation in the United States, and a question has come in about enforcement. At, at the end of the day, if one needs to enforce an international arbitration award, is that also governed federally or is that on a state by state or, or other basis? Uh, both. <laughs> it is uh, the, the actual enforcement of the award is, is, is federal and it's going to be governed by the New York Convention. Uh, so, so, but what that, what that gets you is if, if, you, if there's an award, and you and you want it enforced in the United States against a particular party, it's one thing to to go to a federal court and then say, okay, that arbitration award is now uh, converted into a judgment in the United States. At that point in time, whether how you enforce that judgment against the assets of the party in the United States is governed by state law. So that because it becomes a a comes a U.S. judgment and or usually a state judgment, so you know for example, uh, if the there are assets in in Florida that you want to attach, you have to look at the procedures in Florida as to how you uh, can can levy against those assets. If you know in some cases, if you know this is probably a bad example, but if if the person you know, owns a house there with his wife, you may not be able to, to uh, enforce against that because the Florida law doesn't allow, you know, has a homestead provision that doesn't allow you to go against the person's house or something like that. So it, it, when it comes down to actually enforcing the judgment that you get from the award in the United States, that's governed by the state law where the assets or the, or the uh, party is, is uh, located. Uh, and it's not federal law. If I can jump in to add to that. So not only is this question important because you need to know where the assets are located so you can know what state law to apply. Um, and that impacts, as John said, what assets might be um, collectible to satisfy an award. But it also impacts the procedure. Uh, so for example, in New York, uh, there are a lot of judgment enforcement tools that are very um, powerful. For example, um, freezing orders that can go to banks, other kinds of um, discovery that can be used. So depending on the state law that would apply, you could have um, a really powerful toolbox at your disposal. So that's just something to, to keep in mind as well, that you want to check your, your state rules and see what's available to you um, in terms of um, hunting down assets, as well as, as John said, what assets might be used to satisfy an award. In that process, is there a need to consider at the at the outset where you first go and which courts you first go to to enforce, or is it uh, is that not really part of the the decision making at that point because of the federal nature of the New York Convention? Well, I would I would certainly consider it. You know, as as an example, if uh, if the party that you're seeking to uh, enforce the the award against is uh, has a bank account in New York, and this is from prior experience. We we've been involved in this, uh, and and the their, the fear is that if you if you bring an action anywhere in the United States, the first thing that they'll do is is empty out the bank account. You would you would commence the proceeding in in New York, and at the same time, as Kristen mentioned, attach the bank account uh, under New York law. So that they can't they can't dissipate the assets while while you're getting the award uh, converted and enforced. So it but it you know on the other hand that's a, that's a less likely scenario if someone owns a factory that they're going to sell it in the in the length of time. But but uh, you know if, if if you know where the major asset is, that's where I would bring the action to enforce, assuming that you 
you know, you can identify where the asset is, which is another process that uh, clients have to, even before they uh, commence an arbitration, and they want to at least consider to start. And then certainly when they're at the enforcement stage, you know, spend some time determining what assets there are and which is, I mean, then you have a, you know, strategically, which assets should you go against, which are easier collected, you know, which, you know, which are uh, higher in value, things of that nature. You do that analysis after you have the award. Um, perhaps just one more question in the few minutes we've got left here. In light of the cost consequences that are typically applied under U.S. law uh, and, and your comments earlier, are you seeing an increase in third-party funding in international arbitration? Is it a function of what may or may not be written into the arbitration clause at issue um, and whether funders are interested in and perhaps there's a, something that the parties need to think about in advance as well when drafting their arbitration clauses? Well, I'll, I'll jump in with just a, a quick high level comment and then invite John and Dior to add. I think this is a subject that there is a lot of interest in and uh, there is a lot of assessment that goes in. I will say from experience, both trying to secure funding as well as performing reviews for litigation funders that they use to determine whether or not to fund a case and bring that into their part of their portfolio. Um, there can at times be a mismatch between or, or a, a difference between what a funder wants, which is a, a very high return on investment or a high likelihood of return on investment, and the parties who most desperately need litigation funding. And so it can be hard to match need with, with dollars sometimes. So I think it's always something that's um, very much a topic of conversation. But I don't know that um, that always translates to the same numbers of funded cases that you might think, given the interest level. Um, so that's just one high level comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I certainly agree with that. And yes, there obviously is more third party funding these days. Uh, they, but they tend to, you know, at least in our experiences, that uh, they tend to want the the really uh, you know, high value cases because they want their return on investment, et cetera. Uh, so, and it, I mean, companies do it for different reasons. They, they do it because this is, this is just the way, of, you know, they could fund it themselves. They, they're capable of that, but they, they choose to do it in, in, in this way because of the, you know, cash flow reasons or whatever. It's not just, uh, people who don't have the money to fund. In some cases, it's, it's people who have the money to fund, uh, but uh, to fund it themselves. But for whatever reason, they make a business decision that, and do an analysis that we can do it at a rate that you know, they're, they're willing to accept uh, the funders' uh, charges for it. Uh, so, it's, so, so in that sense, it's, it, it's certainly, certainly more prevalent. Uh, I don't really see... Uh, it's not my experience that you know clauses or anything in 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 the agreements in any way necessarily impact the funding, uh, but that's just my personal experience. I don't know if others have different experiences on that. Excellent, thank you. We are at the top of the hour. Um, thank you very much, John, Kristen, and Diora for sharing your insights today on international arbitration in the United States. Thank you everyone for joining us. And again, the recording of this session will be circulated in the coming weeks.